evening and welcome to the Wednesday, May 5th uh, workshop of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, checking the attendees, we have um, about three people joining us at the moment. Um, so we've got a couple of finance items to top the agenda. Um, so glad to see uh, John Cotteraro here. And then uh, later on, we'll talk about um, pesticide regulations and the um, Conservation Committee's recommendation regarding water body naming. Um, before we do that, is there anybody uh, that is joining us from the public that wants to speak about any of these items in advance of us getting into them? <clears throat> Um, Patricia Wasserman, I see your hand raised. So Matt can open up your mic in just a second and we will um, recognize you. Go ahead, get your name and your address if you don't mind, please. Hi, I'm Trish Wasserman at Three Running Tide Road in the Broad Cove neighborhood in Cape Elizabeth. And is this the appropriate time to make a comment about your pesticide um, discussion that's coming out or is that a separate time? Um, I can, I can go back to you at that point if you wanna um, specifically talk about that um, when it comes up, that'd be fine. Whatever you prefer. Yeah, why don't we do that to, um, so that we're not getting too deep into that, it, that item out of order on the agenda, but um, yeah, we'll be happy to take comment on that at that time. So I, I, I should have clarified, I, I meant any comment on the um, first couple of items, the, these financing related ones, but we'll, we'll be sure to include your um, your thoughts when we get to that item, Ms. Wasserman. So, so seeing no other hands raised at the moment, um, John, why don't I turn it over to you uh, for an introduction on um, the first item, policy related to short-term financing for bonded capital projects. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, in your packet, there are uh, two memos and a draft of the uh, policy statement. Uh, the first memo is dated April 13th. It was written to the town manager in response to the town council meeting the night before in which this item was referred to workshop. And I noted that uh, what I heard was uh, three items of concern addressed by counselors, and I've addressed those uh, as best I could. Um, and then there is the April 29th memo, which is the memo of transmission. And then there is the draft policy statement. The, uh, the document, the policy statement authorizes the town to use its cash reserves that are available to fund short-term capital projects that have bond approval. It sets a limit of $500,000. It requires an affirmative statement from either the finance director or the town manager that the use of the funds to, uh, to take care of the project would not have a detrimental effect on the town's finances. It limits the, the amount of time available for that funding to one year, but it allows for the town council to approve two one-year additions. Uh, the reason for that is that we're dealing with a large construction project. Borrowing short term is a normal course of business. And then uh, you borrow that through a ban and then the ban is either uh, refunded with a bond under that authority or is rolled into the construction bond, uh, which is the permanent financing for the project. So that's the basic outline. Oh, the other thing is that this sets an, a variable interest rate to be charged to the project monthly at 50 basis points over what the town is would be currently getting through its primary banking relationship uh, cash management account. Uh, the reason for this policy request 
is by using this funding mechanism, the town would save on the cost of issuance for a bond, would not need a letter of opinion from bond council, so we save there, and uh, we can move it along very quickly and take care of the, uh, the project until permanent financing is arranged. Great, John, thank you. Um, do councilors have questions? I see uh, Councilor Gabrielson, so your hand go up, go ahead. Um, yeah, I just have a, a just a couple of um, nuancey kind of questions. Um, I, I, I believe that with any project, we should have a purpose, not just what is the project. So what's the purpose of the project? Um, so that we all kind of, so underneath uh, what we would be looking for, it's like, so what's the purpose? And maybe that would be in the name, but I just think that we need to know why we're doing it. Um, the other thing is, is that um, if I could read my writing, we'd be in a good place. Um, I think you already took care of that one. Um, the other thing that I thought about relative to criteria and and maybe the uh, the fact that it says uh, uh, makes reference to it something that is um, approved for uh, a bond order, um, maybe that is, in itself is enough. But um, what are the types of projects that we would want to do this for on uh, type? being um, uh, we want to add uh, uh, solar panels to the police station. Um, we want to do blah, blah, blah. Because um, I would assume that is an, an exception approach, not a norm. So therefore, when I say criteria, it is like what falls within that realm. If this is going to become a norm versus an exception, then um, I think we need to discuss that. But what are the types of projects that would fall right. under this? Let me try and answer your first question regarding purpose. Cool. The purpose would start with the bond order. This, this mm -hmm. uh, policy is dependent upon a bond order having been approved by the town council. So mm -hmm. the purpose would have been identified in the bond order and mm -hmm. that addresses the issue of the purpose. The types of, uh, of uh, projects would be any project for which the town council has approved a bond order. So the town council has the approval authority for a bond order. It states the purpose, and this is just a funding mechanism. If this policy is not approved, it doesn't pose a dramatic problem. It just means that we would issue either the permanent financing against the bond order or we would issue short-term borrowing through bond anticipation notes. But all of that would have been covered in the original bond order, which is why that is the underlying um, criteria in this policy. I think, um, John, if I could put it maybe in more personal finance terms, sure. that might help either other counselors or, or just members of the public who might tune in and see this. I mean, this is basically just adding a financing option. It doesn't change, as you just stated, any of the either process or approvals that would lead up to whether or not the council would choose to appropriate an expense for something. So if you think about sort of your own purchasing and you know, say you need to get a new washer or refrigerator or something, you know, you can pay cash, you can pay credit, you can draw on your home equity loan or line if you have it, you can get a, you know, fixed rate loan, all those types of things. This is, this is merely adding to the list of options for, for um, facilitating that financing, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So, 
the normal due diligence would have been gone through in order to determine whether or not something was a valid and necessary and appropriate expense to begin with. And then as the sort of second in the two-step dance there, okay, and, and how do we think it makes the most sense to actually fund or finance that? So does that sort of clarify things, Penny, from that perspective? I assumed it was just another uh, funding mechanism. I just, I, I just, um, and I understood those nuances. I just um, want to make sure that it's viewed in that way as the due diligence has been done. We now know that this is an option we're going to look at in order to fund something. And that's, that's how it's looked at. And so uh, Matt, the town manager would come forward and say, this is the approach I think makes the most sense for the town and this is why. I just right. want to make sure all of that is understood. And I also want to add that I don't see anything in here about default uh, or non-payment, which there's an assumption here that wherever this might happen, if we were doing this with the school paying it, if there's a, um, uh, uh, a way to say, and not that they aren't going to pay, but uh, those are some of the types of, of things that I also think need to be covered in any financial agreement. So I, I'm not opposed to this. I just want to make sure we all understand uh, the road we're headed down. Yep. Um, Jeremy, I think you wanted to weigh in. Go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, and, and thank you. And I, I, that actually, Penny's question actually raised a, a, another question for me as well. Um, so I guess my first question, John, um, is I, I just want to make sure I understand. So I, I think this makes sense as a good option for sort of saving the town money on financing of projects that, that fall within these criteria and thresholds. Um, I, I just want to make sure. Um, so do you anticipate, like, if we use this financing mechanism, do, is this something that we, you know, where, where we're charging interest, does this have to be reported? And is there any potential for this having any material impact on our overall bond rating for other projects? Or is this, you know, sort of purely something that takes place within the town's ledgers and therefore, you know, isn't going to impact other and, you know, sort of any other financial standing of the town? Does that question make sense? It does, and the answer is that uh, this is an internal financing. It is not anything that has to do with the um, with uh, credit rating agencies. We are we have the highest credit rate credit rating that we can have given our size. If we were a larger community, we would be moved up to the very highest credit rating available to a municipality we're at the second level, um, but this would have no impact whatever. So to extend Jamie's metaphor of buying a new washer, you know, the, instead of us putting it on the credit card or taking out a home equity loan, this is us saying, oh, we happen to have enough cash reserves to finance this project. And therefore it's not, there's no material impact because it's not even getting reported out to, to yeah. a credit Using that metaphor, we borrowed the money from our savings account and we replaced it on a monthly basis. Okay, thank you. Um, and then just to follow up on an additional question that Penny's question raised for me. Um, so it's my understanding that, you know, the town is the bonding agent for the schools. Is that, and so if there were a if there were ever a, a bond that we floated for, for municipal through the municipality for school purposes, whether whether we do that self-financing or for um, or through a traditional bond market, the, the town would is is ultimately the entity that's floated that bond. So we'd ultimately be on the hook for that anyway. Or am I misunderstanding that? No, you're correct. Okay, thank you. Valerie, go ahead. Uh, thanks, John, for doing all of this work. I'm just curious, is this um, a typical policy that towns use? Do, do other towns use this? Absolutely. I spoke with the finance director in the city of Bangor, 
and uh, they use it all the time. They don't go through the policy and bring it to the city council for approval. It's done administratively and it's reported. Uh, typically, this would be reported as a due to, due from between funds. It would be treated as an inter-fund uh, loan and it still would be reported as such. The difference here is that we would have the ability to charge the project and the town council would have had approved it. And the primary underlying um, uh, cause of action would be the approved bond order. Without that, there is no policy to be implemented. Okay, and then my question, you're talking about um, we would charge interest on this. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious why we would charge interest when um, the money that the school would be using to pay this back would be from taxpayers, correct? Wouldn't it be from property taxes and taxpayers? It, it just seems that why would we charge interest when that would just add to the taxpayer's burden? Okay, so- Wouldn't it just be an interfund loan? I wouldn't treat it. That's why I'm bringing it forward under this policy request. There, when you use uh, your money, um, and you don't have it available for earning interest, you impact the current taxpayers. By being able to charge it to the project and then roll that into the long-term permanent financing, that cost along with the cost of the project are passed on over the long term of the borrowing. If this was not handled through this mechanism, the taxpayers would be paying interest on a ban. They would be paying for a legal opinion. They would be paying for the cost of issuance and there'd be a lot more costs that they would bear. Those would also be passed on into the long-term financing. This is a means by which you reduce that total cost of issuance um, that would otherwise be passed on for the long-term financing. No, I, I understand that. And thank you for um, explaining that. It just seems to me that if we were doing it for one year, we wouldn't really even need to charge interest. Um, but. But if we need to, that I understand, but it, it just seems that that was um, a bigger charge to our taxpayers. Penny, you had a further question? Yeah, just a quick one. Um, um, is there a certain number of these we would want to have at any, um, uh, like a, a limit? I'm sure it has to do with, um, you know, that. 12 point whatever percent that we'll talk about later. Um, but is there a, a number that uh, we would uh, want to make sure we didn't have more than three of these at any one time or two or whatever? And I don't even know if that's even a necessary thing to think about, but just a question. All right, so uh, there was a bond order that the council approved last year in which we refunded debt that was issued in 2008. Before that, the bond order was in 2016. The town does not go out to bond uh, very often at best. Uh, whether you say it could only be done uh, once or it could be done twice, we just do not have a history of having bond orders prepared. Um, with Matt, we've uh, shifted from using bonds to using lease purchasing and limiting our lease purchasing period to five years instead of long-term financing for capital purchases. So I, I do not see that even in this interest rate market that the town is going to be issuing a lot of long-term debt. Gretchen. Thanks. Um, so Jeremy and Penny asked most of my questions. So thanks for doing the heavy lifting, you guys. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, 
I did just notice is a really small thing, but the date at the top, you took us back nine years, I think. So I just want to make sure we catch that. Um, and then I just had a question, John. Um, I'm not quite sure how to artic articulate this, but section E uh, that the council can pre uh, re approve. If for some reason the council didn't vote to reapprove, what would happen? We'd either have to pay it back right away or we'd have to take it out for a bond immediately, or those are options. I'm just. Those are the options is to okay. issue, go out to the market and issue a short term bond anticipation note, go out to the market and issue a permanent bond, or to appropriate the money and pay it off using a, a current appropriation. Great, thank you. You're welcome. And this looks great. Thanks for the, your work on this. And I apologize for the transposition. Nicole? Everyone got what I had except the, the date thing. Thanks, Christian. <laughs> um, so I, I'm getting into the nuance of the language here a little bit. But for me, I like to have checks and balances, especially when it comes to money. And so where it says the town manager or finance director can request the financing for town projects. And then the next one says the finance director or town manager shall make the affirmative statement. I just want it to be clear that if one is requesting the money, the other one is making the affirmative statement that we can't have one person doing both of those things um, to request and to affirm that it won't hurt the town. And then the other thing is that the maximum amount self-financed per event is $500,000. And I think this is a little bit along the lines of what Penny was talking about with um, how many do we do a year? Is there a limit? Um, and I think that's where you get to the affirmative statement that there aren't problems, um, like it won't impact anything. So if you can just clarify that, I think you already did, that we, only, we don't get these often enough for us to have too much debt from this. Uh, no, we don't have too much. I can uh, take a look at, uh, for the council meeting, uh, if, if council wishes, I can adjust the language to ensure that one person requests and a different person affirms. I think that does make sense and probably be what, okay. um, you know. I'll work out the first. language for next week. Yeah. Okay. Are there other thoughts, discussion, comments on this item? Jeremy? Channeling Chris Straw here. One last super, super nitpicky thing. Um, a, all of the um, all of the points here end in a period except for D, which ends in a semicolon. So probably just clearing, cleaning that up would. Uh... Okay. All right, thank you. Yep. Um, John, thanks for giving the Bangor example. Um, that was gonna be my, main question was making sure we weren't sort of out on a limb on this. And I, I figured that there were probably other municipalities, whether in Maine or, or elsewhere, um, that were doing this kind of thing. And so um, appreciate you giving the um, example to illustrate that. So thanks very much. You're welcome. Are there any other comments or questions at this point? So we'll make these couple of um, small little tweaks, and we'll look to bring this forward for uh, Monday's meeting um, to approve and authorize. And then, um, Matt, do you or, or John have any sense just anticipating whether or not this will be the likely route that, um, that, that we would want to go on, on the request uh, for the three hundred thousand dollars, it's in the budget from the school. Should that get approved? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. I think it it, it works. Okay. Uh, I, I think they're they're hopeful that that also is the method that's chosen to go forward with as well on the school side. Yep. Okay. Well, if there are no other comments or questions, thank you, John, for this one. But I think we get to keep you around for a little bit. <laughs> so that's, that's what um, I've heard. 
<laughs> Next is the uh, updates to the purchasing procedure and fund balance procedure. Um, uh, before you get going, I'm just going to note we've still got the same three folks, and I'm assuming none of them uh, have an interest in speaking on this item, um, uh, being somewhat related from a finance perspective. But um, seeing no hands raised in the Zoom meeting, we'll, we'll proceed forward. So go ahead, John. All right. I would like to start with the uh, fund balance policy. Um, the uh, fund balance policy was last uh, adopted in uh, 2011, so it's uh, 10 years old. And uh, the uh, draft policy, you have it both in a clean copy and in, uh, in red line, so you can see where the changes are. Uh, fundamentally, uh, the change is to go from having one month worth of revenue set aside to increase that to one and a half months. Uh, one of the things that we saw in the last year during this pandemic was that we were not as impacted as other communities around the nation, but municipalities as well as state governments were seeing a loss of revenues they were laying off staff. Um, they were cutting back on uh, their ability to uh, provide public services. And while we were not as severely impacted as others were, there's no assurance that should we face another fiscal period of stress that we would not be impacted. So the ability to raise our target fund balance will help us in the future. In terms of what that means in dollars, uh, using FY 2020, we had total revenues of 41,641,000. Um, using the 1 12th or 8.33%, that meant a target of 3 million, just under 3 million, 500,000. Uh, actual amount was 4,600,000. Using this revised number at one and a half months or 12 and a half percent, the, uh, the target would be reset to 5,205. Uh, the increase over the current standard is 1,700,000. But having that money set aside um, will provide future councils and uh, future residents with a better assurance to that they can uh, weather a fiscal storm should another one hit. Okay, thanks, John, for the introduction. Matt, can you? I think it would have preceded John uh, joining uh, in his role, but can you, we, while we haven't revised the fund balance policy, we did, if I'm not mistaken, didn't we, didn't we touch on this with once, once we're a certain amount over what's outlined in the policy? Can, can you remind myself and, and the rest of the council of what action we took, if you recall? Yeah, that, was, um, uh, that, that, that predates me, but it was, uh, yeah, oh, okay. it was used uh, for, for funding uh, anticipated capital expenditures, if you wanted to earmark it for that, uh, as well as for uh, lowering uh, the tax rate uh, as, a, as a function of that. But that, that dates no, back. I, maybe, I'm mis maybe I'm misremembering. I, I thought there was something, again, to invoke Chris's name, that Councillor Straw had brought up that, you know, if, if the fund balance, if the unassigned fund balance was in excess of a certain amount um, that, it, that that we'd be required to draw it down to this threshold. You know what I mean? Like that there'd oh, be yes. a, yeah. Yeah. A, ce a ceiling on, on how much could accumulate in the fund balance was the point. Yeah, we, uh, uh, we did. I'm oh, sorry, John. I, I was gonna say during last year's review of the audit results, uh, yeah. while Chris was still on the board, Chris reminded uh, the council and the auditors that the policy, which I have not recommended a change in, says when the, tar when the balance exceeds the target between 100 and 115 percent, 
yeah. that excess amount is supposed to be used to reduce the tax commitment. If right. the balance exceeds 115%, it can be committed or assigned to any capital need or unanticipated expenditure. Um, and again, I have not suggested a change in the, that standard. Okay. That's, that's what I was thinking of, and I appreciate you refreshing my memory on it. So. Yeah, so, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, that, uh, yep. I, I remember the conversation we did we did have about that, but uh, yeah, we hadn't made hadn't made the change. But uh, I do, uh, yeah, we did have that conversation, and uh, just as far as looking, we did have an excess amount, uh, trying to anticipate our future needs for that. So uh, sorry for that part. I knew we hadn't changed it. No, that's fine. And the only reason I'm bringing it up is because I remember the conversation being around just generally. While it seems like a good problem to have, avoiding too much building up in the yeah. unassigned fund balance was the whole objective of that. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, thanks for the reset on that. Um, so, are there folks that have questions or would like to make comment on this? Uh, Nicole, you're first up. I was just wondering what the plan is to close the gap. I don't know if we're currently sitting at like 110 or something, but if we're going from um, 8.3 to 12.5, do we have that cash on hand to immediately make that change? What's the plan there? We don't have the cash immediately on hand. It is a target balance. It's not a required balance. So what happens is as we finish the fiscal year, we see where we are in unexpended appropriations uh, and revenues in excess of, uh, uh, of uh, and expected amounts. We see where we are. And then uh, as we move into the budgeting period for the next fiscal year, we make a judgment on whether or not we commit more to tax relief or we leave it and build it up further. So it, it, it is not a statement of requirement. It is a target to, to look to achieve, but it doesn't say you must be there. Perfect, thank you. I just wanted to make sure we weren't going to be raising taxes and it was, you know, let's hit some target goals. If, if I could follow up yep. on that as well, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Uh, it, yeah, uh, Councilor Boucher, that is, uh, that would be a goal now uh, for us to get to that point uh, from where we are and, uh, but not, uh, yeah, it wouldn't be uh, adding additional burden to the tax rate to, to close that gap. It would be uh, cumulative over time and then try, trying to accomplish that as a goal. And then in the future as well, if, uh, if we are at that goal or just above it and the council may need to drop below that goal, uh, you, you also have that ability instead of, instead of ha having that as a hard floor or a hard ceiling. So you still have the flexibility as the council to uh, to designate funds and use funds as you deem appropriate, but for this is a target versus the versus the hard line. Okay, Gretchen, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm just having a little trouble understanding what the um, it's like the second to last paragraph on here. What this means, the town council may supplementally appropriate the excess fund balance if the excess amount is determined after the start of the fiscal year. I'm having a little trouble wrapping my head around what that means. You could... it, what that sentence is intended to do is, first of all, note that you have the ability to appropriate money out of undesignated or unassigned fund balance. It's a, it's a power that exists and it is merely a statement of what you have the ability to do. Secondly, is um, during the budget process, right now we're working on uh, the budget for fiscal 22, and that will come before the council for adoption next Monday. Mm -hmm. The uh, fiscal 21 uh, budget uh, will close out on June 30th. We'll have a 60-day uh, final expenditures and revenue recognition, and then the audit. So you won't know what the actual uh, undesignated fund balance at June 30th is for several months. But once we have that figure, which would be sometime in the fall, if there are excess funds uh, within this policy, 
it just recognizes that the council does have the authority to use those funds and not leave them for the next fiscal year or to just leave them sitting there for some future date. It just recognizes that you have authority to do your job. Got it. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Are there are other points of discussion at this point. Nicole, go ahead. I'll make a nitpicky. I noticed that you changed all the percentages to 12.50, 100.00. The last paragraph for Portland Headlight has 25% with the, without the 0 .00 in there. Good catch, thank you. Any other I's to dot and T's to cross? Okay, so this will also be brought forward for Monday's agenda. Um, next up, moving right along, is discussion on upcoming uh, capital items. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, we uh, also have a purchasing procedure. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, yep. Okay. This is right, so, uh, in many ways an up, uh, a, a much needed update that John has worked on uh, quite a bit to uh, try to uh, expand the current the current procedure as well as update the uh, amounts to see if the council is is uh, finding those appropriate as well. So hopefully I've teed that up for you, John. So if you want to take over at this point. Thanks. You're done. Good. Thank you, sir. Uh, the last time the uh, purchasing policy was adopted was in 2011, so it's uh, 10 years old. And invoking Chris Straw's name, um, again, last year at the audit review, um, Chris noted that the purchasing policy had not been changed and that uh, he was of the opinion that the numbers were too low. Uh, one of the things I did was look at the school department's uh, purchasing policy, and they set a threshold of $20,000. Um, I looked at that and thought that would be too much of a jump from where we are to get up to that point. Um, so I took or suggesting what becomes a middle ground uh, where we are right now with 500 uh, move it up to 1,500 where we're at now. Um, at 3,500 is move that up to $10,000 and then use 10,000 as the maximum amount um, uh, before we're in full-blown RFP mode. Um, that, that's the primary um, change in here. Um, there is some, uh, some other changes that, uh, such as the use of the town credit card, um, it can be review, re, revoked if it's abused. Um, the policy said that it was subject to disciplinary proceedings, but nothing said uh, it could, the ability to have and use a credit card can be revoked. Um, and uh, it also um, notes what is in effect a casual administrative policy, which is that the town, when it reimburses employees who purchase and then seek reimbursement, has not been reimbursing sales tax because the town has any number of ways to make purchases that employees do not have to use their own funds and then come back and, uh, and seek reimbursement. Uh, in uh, the uh, section two uh, on purchases between 500 and under uh, 1500, I added some language about description of items to be purchased, the unit measurement and, uh, and some, some minor tweaks in the language. Um, and just some renumbering and relettering of the uh, of the bullet points. 
Um, so uh, finally, uh, I added a section at the very end about who has the authority to obligate contracts. Uh, right now, there is no stated authority. When I was with the bank, uh, although I was a senior vice president, the wow. bank board of directors had to annually approve me uh, to grant me the authority to bind the bank to contracts. There is no statement of authority here that says who can bind the town to contracts. So virtually anyone could sign a contract and the town would be obligated to it. So I've added language in there that says the town manager shall be the sole employee authorized to obligate the town, except in the case um, where we're dealing with grants and a grant or agency requires uh, a department head. What I'm thinking of there is Maine Bureau of uh, Traffic Safety requires the police chief to sign the grant. And so this extension to a department head for a grant subject to the town manager's review takes care of any uh, issues that come up with a grant or agency. And the last point that number three just memorializes what our current practice is too, because those grants are all presented to us for approval. Yes, they are. Anyway, so. Um, I have two questions on this one. The first one is um, actually relates to this and, and the, the prior one, uh, John. And in, in both cases, it's been a decade or thereabouts that these were last um, updated and adopted. And I'm wondering if um, <laughs> we need a policy about the update and approval of our policy, you know, how frequently they're looked at and reviewed and so that they don't um, just sit on a shelf. And when we don't have uh, the likes of a Chris Straw or somebody like that, you know, Chris is going to get royalties from tonight's meeting, I think, for the number of times his <laughs> name has been mentioned. Um, but um, what, what is a recommended interval for some of these things so that we can basically build that into a regularly scheduled cadence? All right, so first, let me scare you. Um, <laughs> in addition to looking at these policies, I'm also working on the investment policy. The investment policy has sat fallow since 1987. Wow. It is two Black years Monday? younger than my <laughs> youngest child. Uh, when I started looking at it, I looked at the statutory reference and couldn't find the reference and realized it was referring to Title 30, which was repealed and replaced with Title 30A. Um, so th these are policies that are on the books and have not been reviewed. I think uh, Matthew has noted that during the uh, budget review each year, he's going to systematically have us look at the policies. Um, now, Certainly that can be committed to a council policy statement. Um, it could be set for an annual review or uh, at least once every five years, but administratively, if the town manager uh, requires that it be reviewed more, uh, more often as part of the budget process, it would serve the town well. Um, we yeah, what I'm trying it. to strike a balance. I think I think you hit it right. On, you know, we want, I think we obviously want to strike a balance between not creating an administrative headache and bottleneck, but also making sure that things don't go uh, for decades without <laughs> being looked at either. So, I, I'd be happy to work on a policy statement uh, that requires uh, several things. First of all, is that uh, the policies be documented in a, uh, in a bound book that is provided to all department heads and to council members so that as the overseers of the town, you have an idea of what policies are in place. Um, right. Secondly, is put in there a, uh, a requirement that policies be reviewed 
um, at least once every five years, and that uh, they uh, that the council then in office be required to readopt uh, that policy so that it doesn't say, well, we looked at it, but we didn't take any action. So there's no permanent record to say it was ever reviewed. Right. Okay. Um, I agree with that direction. And, and I think if we work to sort of firm that up, that would be a good, um, you know, a good thing for us to do. The second question I have um, pertains more to Matt and specific to the purchasing policy here. I'm, Matt, I'm wondering if you can just illustrate um, maybe any common examples that you're aware of, of um, the previous limits obviously being too low. I'm not disputing that, but I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to think of is sort of regular and common examples that the existing policy has been a barrier for and whether or not these new um, thresholds would solve for most of those. So maybe you can speak to that since you're the one that would have to um, approve anything in excess of those, so. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A, a good example of that could be possibly, uh, say, uh, a, a heat pump that needed to be replaced. Uh, that might have, uh, you know, those are regularly around $5,000 right now. So if you did that and it was the middle of winter and a heat pump uh, happened to happen to fail, uh, you'd have to go with the RFP uh, versus, and then wait and go through that, that period of time uh, to replace that. Uh, so that's, that's one area that I think, you know, just a quick, a quick fix that you would have to do to have that repaired or replaced. Uh, so that would, that would be one item uh, that, that comes immediately to mind. And we have, uh, currently, we're replacing them at the uh, at the community services building. Uh, uh, we had a pretty significant failure, uh, just out of old age on that. But uh, we're replacing those at this point in time. But we did go out to RFP uh, for that. It's, it, it was greater than ten thousand because it went larger. But uh, that would be a, an example of something that could go, or even a furnace for that matter, in the middle of winter. Uh, if if we had to replace that, we'd have to go out to RFP uh, for a hard a hard item replacement like that. Okay, lots of other hands raised. Let's go Gretchen, then Penny, then Jeremy, go ahead. Thank you. And I'll try to go quickly here and not belabor. No, but okay. um, yeah, I so just as a general statement, I do like these numbers. They do seem a lot more reasonable to me than what appears to have been in here before. So I'm, I'm in agreement with those. Um, John, I'm just wondering, I'm just gonna go through. So I'm in section two and I'm looking like at C where it talks about giving a copy to the vendor. I just wanna make sure we're keeping in mind now that a lot of more shopping is probably done online than when this was originally written. Um, I'm just thinking about, for instance, on the wet team, when we buy a new dry suit, they're like a thousand dollars and we just order them online. So I don't know if we give a copy of a purchase order to the vendor because the vendor is online and not an actual so i just i just want to make sure the wording works for those kinds of purchases and do you think that still applies yeah frankly i don't think it really applies yeah. um uh, i didn't want it to uh, to change it but let me uh, mm -hmm. let me rework some verbiage in there um yeah. if i if i may let me just go back to a uh, question that uh uh Jamie asked about mm -hmm. some examples. Um, Jamie, um, the general provision right now is for purchases under $500 have to be done using a field purchase order. There's only one department that uses field purchase orders and that is public works. And they send over a copy of their purchase order with their invoice for things as small as two bolts. So it makes a lot of work for Al Ward. He's the only one who does it. Makes a lot of extra work for him because he has to prepare it. Jay has to sign it. He has to pull it. He has to send it over. And it's just another piece of paper that is of no consequence. No other department uses uh, that system and it's not been enforced. Um, so on the low end, 
it's an unenforced requirement as compared to the high end where we can have difficulties purchasing something that's necessary. I, I beg your pardon, Gretchen, I'll go back nope. and let you finish your other question. Nope, not at all. No, thank you. For, um, and I was just thinking the same kind of thing in 3A where it talks about needing three bids or proposals. Could that also be like if someone did some comparison shopping and presented three other prices? I'm just thinking you don't often get bids if you're going to buy something online or maybe we're not encouraging purchases nope. that large to be made online. I don't know, but I just it kind of just popped out to me as maybe needing um, a update given our ways of shopping. <laughs> uh, I think perhaps changing it from bids or proposals to quotes. Quotes, yeah, um, that would be good. Or, or, or may, adding, may work. Adding, quotes, adding quotes to that might work as well, because I know we, we have done that in the past on something that does need to be, uh, let's say, purchased uh, in, in a quick manner. Uh, mm -hmm. Generally, like, yeah, with Chief Gleason, for instance, if he has something else, like, you know, if you can find three comparable prices, prices. And, and, and choose what you, you know, especially in specialized equipment, oftentimes there's only mm -hmm. one purveyor of that. So, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's just, that's generally how we've operationally done that. So I think if we add the word quotes to that as well, it gives them the flexibility to, to, to get that uh, done quickly as needed. That sounds great. Um, and then I actually think I only had one more. Um, I'm wondering in 4-H, what is the difference? You changed it from the lowest best bid to the lowest responsible bid. And I'm just wondering what the difference is there. There might be some distinction I'm not aware of. Uh, I, I changed it because a responsible bid is one that meets all of the requirements. The best bid may be um, determined to be the lowest bid. Lowest. Uh, I can give you an example from many years ago. Uh, agency I was at went out and bid uh, copiers and they got sealed bids. And one bidder sent in and said, our bid is 10% lower than the lowest bid you get. And oh. we declined it. And we got told we were going to be sued. And they go to the governor's office. And the answer was, you didn't bid anything. It's mm -hmm. just price. And price doesn't tell us anything about product. And you didn't give us a price. You just said, you'll undercut whoever walked in the door. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the difference in my mind between a responsible bid and lowest best. Got it. Makes perfect sense. Thank you. That was You're it. welcome. Go ahead, Penny. I think Jeremy put his hand up before I did. But I'll go. Going in the order they came up on my screen, so go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I had just two simple questions. Um, one of them is who and how many employees are authorized to use credit cards? And um, should that somehow be represented in here or is it represented someplace else? And I'm, I think you're going to understand I have common themes here. Um, when I look at uh, uh, field purchase orders, if I look at anything that's purchased, a description is about the thing. I always look for purpose, like why do I need it? Um, and so wherever we're looking for information about purchasing something or bids on something, it's um, there's description and there's purpose. So I always seek purpose. So, and, but the credit card one was kind of my number one. You want to take that Matthew? I, I agree on purpose. I also think, uh, if I recall correctly, I think there are seven uh, credit cards that are out currently. Uh, so it's primarily in, in ACP, for instance, there's one credit card for all three departments. And then you have police, fire, public works, finance, and, uh, and then administration. And so it would be John, myself, Deborah. But yeah, it's not, they're not widely distributed. So uh, it's a, it's a, but but the language is important to have in there. So uh, to make sure, because uh, there have been you know, 
there have been examples not in this town. Uh, I want to make sure that's abundantly clear, uh, but in other communities where uh, an employee may have used it uh, inappropriately or inadvertently or what have you, uh, we want to make sure we've got the ability to say, okay, uh, that we're, we're, we're taking that back or you don't have the ability to use that anymore. Anything else, Penny? Uh, Jeremy, go ahead. Great, thanks, Jamie, and thank you, John. Um, this is a great revision update of this policy. Uh, I have two questions. One pertains to section one, uh, no, subsection G. Um, I, I think I would appreciate it if we, where it states that the privilege of the use of the credit card can be revoked. Um, I think it would probably be worth noting that it can be revoked by the town manager um, just to identify who has that authority. Um, and then, yeah. Um, and then my other one is a question um, on section eight, where it refers to purchases over 0.05% uh, of the last state valuation. Um, First a question and then, a, or yeah, first a question and then maybe a follow-up question. Can you remind us what um, that value might be? It's, uh, it's closing in on $2 billion. So this threshold is not going to be met by any, uh, anything that's approved in the budget. So I guess a follow-up question to that I, I did have a question of whether the state valuation was the right number to peg that percentage to. But then a follow-up question is, you know, so I, I thought it was in that range. And I, you know, so we're looking at purchases that are in the like five hundred to six hundred thousand dollar range. Is that is that correct? Yeah. I guess my question is, um, if we're going to set a threshold for purchases on services that need to be approved by the town council, um, and, and this is more a policy question for the for the councilors, although I'd appreciate you, um, input from either you, um, John or Matt, um, what would the right threshold be? That seems rather high to me. So um, if I'm answering your question, uh, it is, it's a very high threshold. It is the threshold that was in the policy 10 years ago. I didn't touch it. Um, I think that the, uh, the council should have more input into purchasing. Um, and uh, I, I, I may be suggesting that uh, a $50,000 uh, minimum um, be required for a purchase to come before and be approved by the council so that you're aware of what is going on. And then you can have the opportunity to see that A, the policy was enforced, that uh, RFP was issued, bids were properly um, received and documented and that it is the lowest responsible um, bid that is being rewarded. So, so I, I did I, 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 there was a little crackle in the line. Did you say $10,000, the, the threshold for the RFP is your suggestion? No, I, I said 50. Oh, okay, okay, sorry, good. I'm glad I clarified. Yeah, I think, you know, I, so we have, a, we have a threshold for for expenses that need to go out for a public vote. And it strikes me that the difference between the 0.5% and the million dollar threshold for sending something out for a public vote is not that, I mean, it's a significant difference, but you know, there, there, there should be, a, I think, a greater difference between you know, sort of the council, the, the, the level of expenses that merit a, a council oversight and then the things that are so big that we need to send them out to the voters. Um, so I'll, I'll post, I don't know what that right number is. I, I think 50 sounds like a reasonable number. Um, I'd, I'd actually like to maybe see a little bit um, more data on this from, from the manager um, in terms of, you know, I, I'd hate to see us filling up our agenda every month with a lot of items that are just gonna go into a consent agenda. Um, but um, I, I do agree that, that having a threshold that's, that's less than 
$500,000 for council approval probably seems prudent. If, if, I, if I may uh, provide some assistance on that. Uh, one thought is that the council approves uh, those purchases during the annual budget process through the CIP. Uh, so uh, that, for that matter, you know, we consistently haven't brought, say we, if we, you, know, you would approve the purchase of say, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, a, a lawn tractor at $35,000 was approved in there. You don't actually per, uh, approve the actual purchase. You know, we'll go out to bid on that and have it purchased that way, but you do, you are granting authorization to purchase it at, at that point in time versus having to bring it back for anything that's above a certain level. So all those amounts are being brought forward versus during the course of the year, uh, say there may be something of a, of, a, of a lesser amount that you have to purchase as part of the operations of the of the department that would be under that threshold that uh, that you may need to purchase. And uh, if it was say, actually, usually those are all built into the budget as well. So uh, if you had unanticipated expenses and perhaps something in the, I'm trying to think the in the maintenance account that was a larger uh, a larger item, say a transmission for our truck or something along those lines, it might have a higher uh, higher a higher price point. But uh, anything above a certain amount is always going to be in in the budget as 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 it is, just not the individual purchase that would you'd be authorizing the manager to uh, to purchase on behalf of the town. So just to follow up on that quickly, Matt. So I guess. Um, if we were to set that at a lower limit, I, and I appreciate that the you know the overall expenditure is in the budget, but in terms of the oversight on sort of approval, you know, sort of public transparency and making sure that the you know the best responsible bid is being selected, particularly for larger ticket items yeah. where it's a sort of an individual expense that's over, just to use the fifty thousand dollar number that John suggested. How many, if we were to go with a number, if we were to recommend going with a number like that, how many individual purchases a year are we making that would be over that $50,000 threshold? Ballpark. Less than five. Would be, would be, and that would probably be in an active year, <laughs> quite frankly. Uh, we don't really, uh, yeah, general, I mean, yeah, you, you you basically see them every year. If you if, if we're doing a purchase of that number, it's in CIP, and uh, and and we're identifying that as it is. Uh, this year would be the loader, for instance, would be one. Um, it would be the big thing. Uh, last year would have been the tower uh, that we that we've talked about as well, communications tower, uh, or plow truck, uh, or pickup truck for that matter. This year, uh, even you know we we're, we're getting close to that now with uh, with cruisers for the police department uh, with where they're at. Uh, as well, those are uh, coming up in price. Um, one thought I had on looking at that is, I have a feeling that 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 one uh, one hundredth of one percent uh, that was initially established when I started with the town, and I'm not trying to go back through the mists of time and uh, tell old stories, but uh, we were roughly, I think, seven hundred million in value. And now we're uh, roughly one billion seven hundred and fifty million in value. Uh, so that number uh, meant a lot more uh, back in the day, <laughs> twenty years plus ago, uh, and two revaluations in the market. So uh, it may be worthwhile to look at that and say, uh, as you're closing in on a billion, say that would be uh, one ten. Uh, sorry, point zero one uh, or. Uh, one one hundredth of the state valuation may be a more appropriate number to use now. Uh, so that would be like one hundred and seventy-five thousand or something like that, and that would probably put you in the larger ticket item uh, range. Just just as a thought, and it would probably have a similar impact uh, from back back in the day. Which which also brings me to my other follow-up question of whether or not it's the state valuation that should be the the trigger. And my only concern there is, you know, we're currently at eighty five percent of of the state valuation. So, you know, if the state valuation is the right number, um, you know, why not the municipal valuation? And then you're talking about you know a significant difference in what the value is. It seems to me that it's probably a more more transparent and and more clear to just specify an amount. Um, that would, you know, make this a little bit more easy to say, see where yeah. we're following it. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Maybe we can come, maybe we should uh, have a thought on this and come back with maybe a better recommendation uh, that might, that might work mathematically. 
I, I'd appreciate that. Valerie and then Nicole. Um, I just have a, a small um, question here for you, John. On page two at the very bottom, it's under number one N, which you've added to um, regarding reimbursements um, to employees will not include sales tax. Um, is that for any type of purchase? I understand large purchases and that we can, we have ways to um, purchase things without sales tax. But does that include small things too? Because I, I know working with the school, there's times when volunteers or other people go out and buy coffee, pizza, whatever. Is that, is that everything across the board? So um, they, you wouldn't reimburse sales tax? That is how it's been done um, since long before I got here. Uh, that's how they do it in the school department. And that's how accounts payable treats town employees. Um, when there is a request for sales tax reimbursement, Allah has brought it down to me. And the only time that I've approved it is if it is for um, clothing allowance um, so that the uh, public works employees are given a certain amount for their clothing allowance each year. And if uh, instead of using the town's purchasing power, they buy it on their own, I do reimburse them their sales tax. Um, I have been rather lenient about okaying um, reimbursement of sales tax as compared to the school department. Um, but by putting this in here, um, it just codifies what we currently do. Certainly, um, it can be uh, rewritten to make it discretionary so that um, it can be overruled and it can be allowed. Okay, or, or even a, a, a limit like, uh, you know, under $100 or something like that, maybe um, re reimbursed. Because it just seems that if teachers or people are purchasing they don't have a credit card, but they're purchasing some things and then to not reimburse them, just a little bit of sale tax that, that just after they spent their time and all um, buying things, it just doesn't seem quite fair to me. So if, if I work language in there, not to exceed uh, $10 in sales tax paid, yeah, so what would be easiest for you? Because it seems like this is creating- Oh, it's all easy. It's all easy. Okay. That sounds good. I, I don't know what other people think about it, but it just seems, um, I'm glad that there is some discretion in there. All right, I'll work that in. Does, Valerie, do you, the examples you're giving, do you have a sense of frequency on that? Well, I, I know, I just know with the school, volunteering and doing stuff, uh, going to debates or you're at other schools and one of the teachers purchases food. Um, everybody goes out and purchases a meal for everyone and then takes it back and gets reimbursed um, through the account or there's different things like that. Um, I'm sure it's not, doesn't happen a lot, but um, I don't know, I just kind of hate to see people, especially when you talked about ordering uniforms and things, they probably don't, everyone doesn't have their own credit card um, to use through the town, so they'd be reimbursed. Um, but it sounds like John's got a handle on it. Yeah, I, I'm not, I don't object and I understand the point. I, I, I guess I didn't have a very good frame of reference to how often the examples that you were giving were actually occurring, that was all, so. Well, I think um, with the school, it would yeah. it happens quite a bit, but um, I don't know with the municipal employees. It's, yeah, it's more common on the school side. Uh, these conversations with the AP folks, I, I found that uh, to be more common. They have a lot more people, uh, quite frankly, so I think that's where the exposure uh, grows there. 
on the, on the town side, uh, casual purchases are, 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 are not, as, not as prevalent. Okay, uh, Nicole, go ahead. Um, I'm putting on my auditor's hat for my uh, standard operating procedure days and especially around the credit cards and where you say, okay, we only have seven of them and they're, I'm assuming they're like kept in a safe in that department or anything, but is there a place that spells out how these credit cards are kept under lock and key and is it actually safer for everyone who uses them to have one in their name so you can trace back who made what transaction because you know you've got like a credit card for an office and three different people using it 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 just opens up more risk than i think having more credit cards opens up um so there's that piece of things and then the other thing from my uh, auditor hat is that they email the town manager for approval when it's you know between 1500 and 10000 and is there a form email? Is there a, you know, you can build things with, I don't know, Microsoft and SharePoint and all these things where people all submit the same form. So there's standardization to it. So that way we know decisions are being made in a methodical way. And uh, I think uh, Penny brought up the, what's the business case for asking for this purchase, have being on there. You know, is there a standard process? Or are they literally just emailing Matt saying, hey, I need to buy this thing, yes or no? And how are those stored? Like, these are all process questions that I don't think necessarily needs to be in the policy, but I'm just wondering what needs to go here just to make sure that there is a process and it's documented. I, I, I can respond on, on both of those, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the cards are in that specific department head's name and on the ACP instance, uh, for instance, it's, a, it's in Maureen's name. Uh, but uh, generally, uh, you know, as, as I used to use it as the assessor, I would talk to Maureen and we would uh, just make sure we all knew that that was being used for that specific purpose at that time. And then it comes in on that department on a monthly basis. And then you make sure that you've got it on the line item. Uh, where the expense is with the receipts that all have to be attached to the uh, to the invoice. So uh, it's tracked pretty heavily uh, on, on that side. Uh, so mine, mine is in my name. I know the one in the ACP office is locked up on a nightly basis. Uh, and then mine, uh, mine travels with me uh, majority of the time as well. Uh, and I think others, they may have them locked up in their own departments as well. So uh, they're, they're highly secure on that side of it. Uh, and then as far as uh, uh, request to purchase, uh, depending upon what it is, uh, I end up usually asking the person if they do, you know, they want to get it in writing, explain to me the, why, uh, you know, what, what they're looking to purchase, why they're looking to purchase it. Uh, you know, in the case that I need to have three different estimates, uh, if they're available, I want to have those three identified as well and why they've chosen to, to have that. And so it's dated and, and I do save that as well. Uh, and then we have that as part of the file that would go with that purchase. Thank you. And then, yeah, on the public work side, I think Bob, Bob always used, now Jay uses the purchase orders that, that, that they have as well. And, uh, and, and then on, on facilities, the school side is more pre uh, prevalent with using purchase orders. I know Perry also will use purchase orders and get those to me in advance as well that describes it. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Chairman, both your microphone and my microphone were muted. <laughs> Sorry. I was first asking if anybody else had any other discussion points or questions before I started going into my own. <laughs> um, so on this one, it sounds like maybe there's just a slight bit more work. And if, if that's ready for Monday, great. But if not, maybe have to push this one off or... We will take a look at this uh, and reconvene tomorrow. If it looks like the, there's something we can do uh, to bring it back, we'll, we'll try. If not, we may see, you may see this again in June. Okay. So um, if there's no other comments or discussion on this one, 
come back to my agenda. We can, at this point, move on to item number three, which is a discussion of upcoming capital items. Um, we're up to four folks uh, in the audience. Does anybody uh, that's joined us want to speak up on this one? Or if not, we'll be getting to the pesticide one right after this. Just seeing no hands going up. Uh, Matt, uh, are you or John taking the lead on this discussion? I, I think I'd be prepared to, uh, to, to go okay. forward on this, Mr. Chairman, if it, that'd be helpful. Yep, I, go ahead, uh, please. Sure, uh, looking at the last conversation that we had uh, roughly a week and a half or so ago uh, regarding the uh, long-term capital items and trying to look at also uh, as debt is retired and trying to kind of put that into perspective, at least for the council as you look forward over the next few years, I thought it might be helpful to, to take a look at uh, at least some of the larger ticket items that we have scheduled or at least on the, on the I'd say in the next six year horizon, five to six year horizon uh, that, that are known or at least anticipated at this time. Uh, some of which have numbers associated with them, but, but also to look at during that same window, what uh, the council has uh, for, uh, or what the town has for bonded debt and as that and how that is being retired. And if I may for a moment, I'd like to share my screen to show you kind of what I've, what I've uh, got at this point in time. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll also provide this to you once I uh, get it a little bit more refined, but hopefully this will give you uh, a good look at what we have. Uh, can you see that okay? Is there a spreadsheet that you have on your screen? Perfect. Uh, so, so what you'll notice on on the screen and uh, uh, Matt, it's pretty yeah. small. Matt, can you, can you is it okay? Matt, yeah, can you make it larger for some of us eyesight impaired people? <laughs> Let's see. You're speaking. You're preaching to the choir. That may be a little bit. I may have to bring that down a little bit. Try this one more time. How does that look? A little bit better. That's great. Yep. So, uh, so what you what you find here is that uh, at the beginning, at the, at the on the top of this spreadsheet, you'll notice uh, these are our current bonds that we have out there, uh, starting with uh, as a retired. Uh, so this year we have two different uh, bonds or leases that will be retired in the coming year. One is the community center. So that uh, that actually goes back. Uh, we're in the, this is my 20th year plus with the town and this is the 20th year for that bond and it is being retired this year. At, uh, so our last payment will be made at 78,750. And then we also had a copier, uh, copier lease that the town entered into, I think roughly five years ago, that's also retiring this year. And then uh, you'll notice I have the project and description in the middle there. And then coming over here on the savings, what I what I showed there is the savings by fiscal year. So um, next year or for fiscal 23, the town won't have that $88,000, $576 combined liability from those two bonds that are retiring this year. And then uh, in fiscal year 23, which would be next year's budget, uh, a year from now, uh, you have the fire department ladder truck, which is a lease purchase that we entered into five years ago, and that will be retired next year. And then you'll notice the savings after 23 will be 318,000. Uh, the cumulative amount would be the combined savings that pay off of 406. That would be the uh, 22 plus 23's retirement amount. And that's, this column here will be kind of a rolling number uh, total accumulation as, as those are retired. And then going forward in 24, there's uh, some, uh, another lease purchase bond that will be, or a lease purchase that will be retired in 24. And then in 25, it'll be the turf field, which seems like it was just last year. It was by then, <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be five years out and that will come off the books. Uh, and then some of the larger ones would be the sewer bond, uh, which, which will be 20 years old in, 20, in fiscal year 27. Uh, the town center bond uh, in 28. And then, so what I end up looking at here uh, in, in the next six years, seven years, the town will have a combined savings at some point as those bonds are retired, uh, if nothing else was put onto that of $854,856 cumulative over that window, window of time. Uh, 
now that's that's saying that everything else stays the same uh roughly well you know obviously during that time we'll have other capital needs but we'll try to meet those as they come on uh relating to say uh lease purchase approaches that we've done for larger ticket items on an operational side but then uh looking below uh the closest things, closer items that we do have in the anticipated future is shore road improvements would be the probably the larger item that the largest item that we have uh, looming in the distance at this point in time. We'll be starting the the, the planning and engineering for that this summer, uh, following up from the original work that was done a year ago. Uh, so that that work shall continue. Uh, the estimated cost on that on the high end is roughly five million dollars. Uh, that's a hopeful number uh, because construction costs have been growing as everything else this year has. Uh, I know Portland's gone out to some some projects and they've they've grown by over thirty percent of what their estimated initial price was. So uh, we had a range of three point five to five million on that project going in, depending upon the scope and scale of that. Uh, but that being said, uh, that's why I put in the five million. Uh, thinking about that for either. You know, estimated for fiscal 23, so a year out from now, or a year beyond that, in fiscal year 24. Now, uh, the debt service on that, and this would be anticipating that we receive no state funding or a grant or, or other funding for that. Which uh, I I will I will preface this conversation by stating that for everything that we do have identified here, we will be pursuing any alternative fundings uh, or funding models that exist out there to help offset that. Uh, Shore Road, for instance, would be a, a prime candidate for either PACs, uh, regional funding, or MPI state funding uh, to help offset. Those are not full funded by those projects, uh, funding project, funding uh, sources, but uh, the town would have a match uh, of somewhere from either ranging of a low of 25% to 50% or more uh, that we would have to come up with. But still, that's uh, a half a loaf is better than having to buy the whole loaf. Uh, when it comes to that but looking at the debt service estimate that would be uh, the debt service over a 20-year bond at two and a half percent for shore road so you'd be looking at adding debt service of roughly three hundred and thirteen thousand dollars annually the other item that uh, there's a couple of items that are, are also uh, are out there which is the replacement of uh, mitchell road culvert which if you look at the entrance to hobstone uh, there is a huge culvert that exists under that road. That's our culvert, and it uh, it's stable, but it does need to be replaced uh, probably in 24 or 25, uh, or fiscal year 24 or 25. Uh, it's been on our, our radar for some while, and if you remember, for counselors who were with us at the time, the culvert study that was performed, uh, that was one of the higher priorities for replacement that we do have. Uh, the other uh, that comes to mind uh, in the near term would also, if, if you're going to do that, it may be a good opportunity to go to a, uh, a bond or at least or potentially combine them together in a bond uh, with the Shore Road package uh, to do that as well. But uh, Spurwink culvert at the, uh, at the crossing of the Spurwink River on Spurwink Avenue, uh, just, after, uh, just after Colonial Village uh, at that crossing there, uh, again, for those council members who are here, and uh, I'm not sure if Councilor Noonan was with the wet team at the time, but uh, you almost needed to be deployed to pull me out of that uh, culvert because I was standing on the side when uh, it eroded and I almost went to Scarborough one afternoon. <laughs> so uh, that that's on the radar for needing to be replaced at some point in time. Uh, Willowbrook is the, is the culvert above it that's being replaced in this year's budget. That is... Uh, that's a pretty substantial project. This is downstream from that, and due to, uh, you know, due to tidal impacts, uh, right now it's it's you know we may find that that will need greater capacity uh, sooner rather than later. Right now it is uh, there are there are signs of scouring that are in there, and you can see that from the volume of water that goes through there uh, as well. So that would be on more of the near term. Uh, the next item that comes up within that within that five-year window would be the cemetery evergreen cemetery expansion or possibly uh, finding an additional uh, parcel to expand a cemetery into and uh, as we talked about last week that is an item that uh, we that's an unknown cost at this point in time and 27 is is probably the worst case scenario that we would need to uh, 
to find that purchase, but uh, but I think that's something that the town will want to have a, a thought on within the next five to seven years, uh, and at least have an action plan in place uh, for for uh, expansion or uh, adding to. And then uh, the additionally the sewer expansion now uh, that would be to expand our current our, our current sewer system that is in the town. Uh, one of the areas that have has been identified is. Uh, it, within the uh, the Hampton Roads neighborhood off from Fowler Road as a natural expansion uh, for that due to smaller parcel as well as uh, parcel sizes as well as uh, it may be a, a perfectly structured neighborhood that would allow for the expansion of that. That fiscal year 28 estimated fiscal year also lines up if you look up above uh, the sewer bond being retired in fiscal year 27. So that there's a there's a, uh, a reason behind a, or a linkage behind that as you notice that that one would be retired it would be the opportunity at that point to perhaps expand that into there uh, that's a rough estimate at four and a half million to to do that expansion it could be it could be greater uh, but when, uh, looking at that uh, debt service on that would be 20 years at 169,000 basically almost 170,000 at that point, looking at possibly uh, three and a half percent uh, as a guesstimate on the on the interest rate, uh, but then you'd also look at by that point in time using part of, of roughly two and a, two and a half million dollars from the sewer fund that currently exists that uh, the rates are going into or the funds are going into to help uh, for that uh, future use. And then two final items that uh, are are also out there in the further out years would be. Uh, Sawyer Road uh, project that exists uh, where uh, along with the town of Scarborough uh, and the town would have to decide uh, what it would like to do for that. Uh, there are options that that could exist out there with either uh, discontinuing the road and, uh, and and removing what currently exists there uh, before the before nature takes it back over and it does a number of times during the year. Uh, specifically with flood tides at the present time, it's, it's known for overtopping and, and majority of that overtopping takes place below the culvert that we uh, that sits in, it sits in Cape Elizabeth, but the Scarborough section is the one that's heavily impacted. Uh, that would take some coordination between the two communities. And then finally, the last would be uh, expansion for the fire department within five to six years for additional uh, residential expansion for sleeping quarters for, for uh, a larger uh, fire slash uh, rescue rescue service that would that would be uh, in place. Uh, that would be uh, so. Those are the items that that quickly come to mind, or not quickly, but have been scheduled uh, uh, over the years and uh, do do sit out there. Uh, now, this does not take into consideration uh, anticipated, uh, you know, large ticket items that the school is anticipating, but that's a. Uh, uh, I thought it might be helpful for the council to see uh, what we what we do have sitting on the out years uh, for for the at least the larger ticket items. You know there there'll always be dump trucks and loaders and and uh, and and rescue vehicles. Uh, sorry, ambulances that'll that'll also need to be replaced. But those are more of the uh, operational cost uh, side of it than 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 these really super uh, large ticket items that that sit out there. Hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, no, Matt, that's super helpful. What strikes me on that list <clears throat> is that much of what's there is either um, sort of of the replacement maintenance variety, um, and, and whether that be roads and culverts and things like that that are, you know natural end of life replacements or whether it be equipment that's a natural end of life re replacement there's not a lot on there if, if if we tie this back to the exercise we did last week with the budget and aligning our goals with you know expenditures and and fiscal planning and things like that there's not a lot on there save for maybe the fire station that it sort of relates to expansion of services or or enhancement of services. So I think about the cellular conversation that we keep having or um, the connectability and walkability in town and sidewalks and things like that. And you know maybe there's a couple of you know, certainly I know that 
in the original engineering plans or 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 look that we saw on Shore Road, there there were absolutely um, you know walkability and bikeability and, and things like that that were built into that. But um, people can also do that today. Uh, you know that would be improving that capability, but not necessarily expanding or adding that capability. So as we go forward, not at all looking to dig into it tonight, but as we're doing this and we start to go forward with the school department in sort of overlaying some of their similar work and, and um, exercise here, I think it'd be important for us to start sort of bucketing those things that are, um, not only are they a known expense, but what sort of category of expense is it? Is it something that, again, it's that programmed, you know, fire truck is, is gonna need to be replaced. Uh, that we just know the road's going to wear out or something like that? Or is it, hey, this is, this is a, an additional service that we're adding? And I mean, it'll help us in terms of, again, tying back to our goals, but I think it'll also help the public and the citizens to see, you know, what are the costs and the sort of horse trading that you need to do to say, oh, well, why can't we have all of these things? Well, here's what, you know, so if you, you, you know, and that, that's where you start to get into more of the wants and needs, I think, discussion. So, so what... One item that also comes to mind and would be tied in with the like the sewer expansion would be sidewalks on on, on Fowler Road. You know that's yeah. that would be a natural uh, connection that would take place while you're doing a sewer expansion. Is in that section would be you know the continuation of what we're doing with segments one and two uh, the next year. Uh, that you know would be the natural expansion for that to to service that re heavily residential neighborhood as well. So. Uh, yeah, those are definitely items that we'd like to, you know, look at in the future going forward. Yeah, so, you know, I think this is a good start. I think we need, I think we have more work to do to layer in some of those things that are unplanned, unprogrammed as of now and aren't of the, the sort of wearing out variety. So, um, Jeremy, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. And and thanks, Matt. Um, this is a great um job pulling this information together and, and looking at it. Um, I think one of the things that might be helpful for me in terms of, of thinking about this and, and thinking about programming costs, I appreciate the, the work you put into sort of identifying when the bonds, individual bonds are being retired and the savings. Um, for Just for the way my brain works, I, I think it'd be helpful to see sort of like, what's our total bond payment in a given year? And then, and, and then relative to the savings. And, and I think that would just help me have a better view of, okay, so this $78,000 bond payment comes off. And if we don't add anything more to the plate, then our anticipated bond payment that year would be, you know, X minus 78,000. Um, and, and then just as we're, we're looking at potentially plugging in different projects, I think it would help us um, kind of see, see the impact in terms of that total total annual payment. Um, and then um, the other the other thought that I had just in terms of Jamie's question on sort of what are the sort of strategic opportunities that we um, have on the radar screen, I, I think the the idea of, of sidewalks um, as a potential add-on with the, the sewer on Fowler is a good one. Um, I know we've also had some discussion and there's some discussion in the comprehensive plan around Mitchell as well. Um, which is another area that you know I just think it's worth at having that as a as a potential item that we may need to look at bond funding for in the future. Yeah, most surely, and, and I'll be happy to because um, because I, I don't want to give Councillor Penny Jordan uh, any any more ice cream than that I try to put on on a daily basis. Anyways, so I will ship you over the. Uh, 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 we do have that grand total, so you can see that as well. Uh, it's a great spreadsheet, but. To screen share, it would probably it would it would probably short circuit us all. So I think we'll make sure we get that over too. Oh, and and while we were talking, just two other things that um you know again circling back with Fort Williams Park to see if any of the potential items that are coming out there might be of that bond level of expense. Um, and then the other one that I didn't see on there um, is, and I know we've we've taken a look at trying to crack this nut in a variety of different ways, but it strikes me that the last time we looked at sort of formal numbers around the historical society, Spurlink School, that that was at a level of expenditure that might merit bonding as well. Yeah, and I, I, I did, uh, you know, I, I struggled with 
putting that on, it was on, it was off, it was on, it was off. So uh, the one area that the uh, thought on that would be also working with the, with the historical society on, a, on a, you know, trying to find uh, a capital campaign that they may also want to participate at. So, uh, you know, the upwards number of that was a million dollars. Uh, and then the revised was roughly 815. And unfortunately, we didn't, uh, we didn't have the good, good graces of receiving one of uh, Congresswoman Pingree's 10 uh, earmarks that I applied for. So, but hey, we took a shot. <laughs> Other reactions to or discussion about Matt's uh, list here? Um, Matt, do you know if um, if uh, Donna and team are sort of going through the same exercise like we discussed yet, or uh, or have you shared this with her? Maybe if if they aren't, I, I know they've got other stuff going on, but maybe share this with her as a way to. Um, Sort of like that spark. Uh, she she's she's been out this week, uh, but she's back yeah. tomorrow. So I do have this uh, to share okay. with her because I have a couple other items that, that we need to circle back on as well for scheduling uh, that that uh, combined meeting with the school board as well to, to come back on the one one town concept as well as these as well as these items. So okay. Um, anybody else on this item? All right, thanks, Matt, um, and uh, staff that supported in pulling that together. Appreciate that. Um, so now we're back to um, the item on uh, pesticide regulations. There's a memo in the packet uh, from the ordinance committee, uh, and I know we had at least one person that wanted to speak up on this. Um, so uh, Ms. Wasserman, uh, Matt will pull you up at this point. You may have to raise your hand. Oh, no, there you go. Uh, so um, your mic is open. If you wouldn't mind, again, just your name and address one more time. Sure, thank you. My name's yep. Trish Wasserman. I live at Three Running Tide Road in the Broad Cove neighborhood. And um, thank you so much for even including this item on a really dense agenda. I can't believe that you guys have to sit through all of this, all these every month, many times in a month. So thanks for putting this up there and helping to make it a priority. Um, I know you'll be, you've been doing a lot of work in the committee for which I'm grateful. I wanted to comment tonight that I will hope you would consider in the mix, rather than aligning with what Falmouth is doing, Consider aligning more so with what South Portland and Portland have been doing. And in particular, I think, uh, consider the South Portland regulations that are, are now in place. Um, I think that probably it aligns better with what our needs are in Cape Elizabeth to help us work toward better protecting our fishing community, you know, with, with the application of pesticides and herbicides directly running off people's lawns into Casco Bay to help um, protect our farmland community by continuing to preserve the, the ability of pollinators to be in our community, um, to have a sensible ordinance that still allows commercial use of pesticides for the farming community in Cape in an appropriate way, um, and to really be very specific in educating everyone about why we all want to be more conscious of what we are doing when we're applying products or allowing outside companies to apply products to our lands, to our town's lands. I think our farming community already is very conscious of what they're applying and we're pretty thoughtful about how they're doing it. But I'm really concerned about our general population. And I think we really have a poor understanding of what it is we're doing and how it's affecting everyone around us. And I think that the Falmouth ordinance, I, I might be missing something but it's so vague, it just requires registering that you're going to use it. It doesn't provide guidance on the kinds of things that might be appropriate or not. And I feel like we um, could do a better job at actually identifying products and, or types of chemicals that are potentially harmful, educating us ourselves and others about it and being more thoughtful about how we're using any kinds of herbicides, which includes pesticides and sexicides, and implant um, deterrence 
in Cas and, and how it directly is, is pouring into Casco Bay and all of our greater watershed um, here in, in town, our marshes and all of those things that we so treasure as part of who we are and our community here, you know, farm fish and otherwise. So thank you for doing this. I'll turn it over to those of you who have given this even, you know, just much greater thought but please let me know how we can help and what we can do. And again, thank you for putting this on the agenda. Thank you for your comments um, and uh, both specifically regarding the, the item, but also uh, appreciate um, your remarks generally about the work. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else that uh, wanted to offer comment on this item at, at this time? Seeing no hands go up, um, Penny, um, as ordinance chair, would you like to just uh, introduce this and give a little bit of overview of the committee's work? Sure. Um, I, uh, um, let's see, where do I wanna start? Um, number one, um, the ordinance committee, we had, uh, we received a couple of um, presentations regarding, um, uh, pesticide, pesticide ordinances and kind of what's going on um, uh, across the state and what different communities are doing. Uh, one of the things, and I, um, I had uh, Maureen sent it uh, along to me that I think becomes very useful and was really uh, guided uh, a lot of the work that was done uh, by not only uh, Falmouth, but is used to guide uh, and uh, water, um, and it's about yardscaping. Um, what we honed in on, I think, as an ordinance committee was um, some of the things and why we um, uh, lean toward uh, Falmouth is that Falmouth was looking at it that they didn't have a full uh, understanding of uh, the problem and uh, the impacts on uh, water sources, et cetera. And they also, um, just as uh, uh, Ms. Wasserman, Wasserman said, uh, there was an education piece that they saw was a gap that there are many people in the community that are, are, don't have a full understanding of the impacts around the uh, use of uh, uh, certain pesticides. There was, an, uh, there was also not a firm understanding of what types of pesticides and fertilizers were being applied. And so that's why they started to take the direction around um, looking at what is it that uh, the uh, professional uh, lawn maintenance uh, companies, which I believe they uh, ended up finding out that there were like 19 of them within the community that had registered and there, there could be more, what they were applying and where it was being applied. And they also started looking at where might the um, uh, areas be where there could be um, some uh, runoff into different water sources. And they didn't have a good feel for uh, what uh, uh, testing of those waters and, and what the impact was. So basically they set out and I think what, uh, kind of attracted us to uh, Falmouth is that uh, they had engagement. They engaged different uh, members of the community, uh, different uh, factions, and uh, really came up with what is it that the problems that we need to solve. And it took them about a year and a half to really, and many drafts of their uh, ordinance to really come up with uh, what they have in place today. And this is basically the way the ordinance is written is it's really a, uh, 
uh, has an education portion to it. And so how do we educate the community on the use of pesticides? It has a data gathering element to it, which is what is it that it's being applied in the community and how big is the problem that we're trying to solve? Um, and as I said, yardscaping played a, a big role in helping them uh, define it. We did look at South Portland, Portland ordinances, and I believe one of the speakers, she gave us examples of ordinances around uh, other communities. And I believe we felt that this fit Cape Elizabeth uh, at this point in time, because it took the approach of getting our arms around what the issue is and what actions need to be taken, rather than taking action and not really having a full understanding of uh, the problem that we're trying to solve. And I think another key point is we uh, constantly talk about pesticides, but fertilizers become an important part of that as well. And uh, education uh, to the community on uh, fertilizer application. So uh, that's kind of where we got in a nutshell. Do you want to add to it, Jamie? Well, first, thanks. Um to you and the committee for the work and also for the thorough explanation there. Appreciate that. Um, I don't I don't have anything specific I wanna jump in on at this point other than to you know, open it up for other thoughts, um, whether it be others on the ordinance committee. Um, if you wanna to add to anything that um, the Penny just outlined or just other counselors with thoughts in general, so. Go ahead, Jeremy. Um, yeah, thanks, Jamie, and thank you, Penny. Um, so I am currently on the Ordinance Committee. I wasn't when this memo was pulled together, um, but I just wanted to ch chime in and say, um, I'm generally supportive of this approach. Um, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to pull together some data and better understand um, where we're at, and then also to, to pair that ordinance with other policy levers we can pulling, particularly education to try and help you know, reduce the, the use of, of unnecessary applications of pesticides and fertilizers. Um, I also did um, take the opportunity to reach out to some other colleagues um, with conservation organizations around the state um, as a member of the um, Main Invasive Species Network um, to a number of folks who are working on this and to a person, everyone I reached out to uh, point when I asked them for model ordinances that we should be looking at pointed to the Falmouth ordinance as you know one of the example ordinances that that um, people should be looking at. So uh, I just wanted to add that as um, you know, uh, sort of an additional endorsement of this approach. Um, it's one that's pretty widely supported within that you know co uh, community of of. Um, folks who are working on invasive species management as well as, as the conservation role. So. Thank you. Uh, Valerie, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I, um, I agree that education por portion is really important. And um, I'm, I'm just a little surprised that um, Falmouth is really what we're looking at. It just seems to me that our identity is a little bit more like South Portland with, um, with our water, our um, connection to Casco Bay. It just seems to me that maybe we would, our identity is a little more like South Portland and Portland. But um, I think what we're looking at is sort of like, where do we begin? And I think education important is really important. And if we want to take that route, um, a year, a year and a half just seems like such a long time to me when we already know from um, different reports, different studies, talking to other people, other towns, looking at, I, I think there's two dozen towns now in um, Maine that have regulated pesticides and herbicides. Um, and for us to take a year and a half to do some regulating just seems to me like a really long time. Uh, so 
is there a way we can begin with um, the town's properties? Sort of what, have a discussion while we're doing the other um, that Penny was talking about. Do we talk about, um, this is what we're using for pesticides and herbicides in the town. This is, this is what we can do with town proper properties. Um, these are the ingredients. This is the chemicals we're using. And really look at that first. Is that something? Um, and also it seems like um, we've got Friends of Casco Bay. We've got Gulf of Maine Research Institute. And um, I was told that the director lives here in Cape Elizabeth. Seems like we've got, and we've got our land trust. We've got some really great resources to um, talk to and collaborate with. Um, what about Sprague? I, I would think that they have someone in their organization that um, is informed about pesticides, has methods and resources they're using um, that would collaborate with us. It just seems that um, there may be ways to move this along, along quicker than um, a, a year and a half. And just looking at South Portland's um, and, and Portland's websites, they have um, education, frequently asked questions. Um, they're talking to people about lawn care practices. It, it would give us a chance to put something like that together too. But I think what Penny is saying is where do we begin and how do we, how do we start this process? So I'd really love to talk about that. How, how do we begin this? Um, Gretchen, your hand was next, but I think Penny's just gonna offer an answer to one of the points or um, maybe a clarification uh, right. to one of the points that, that Valerie right. was just making, so. Uh, Valerie, when I used the, um, the, the number year and a half, that was to uh, kind of impress on uh, people the, um, the amount of work that Falmouth put into create, crafting their ordinance. Not that uh, Cape Elizabeth has to take a year and a half. Um, in addition to, uh, Falmouth has uh, uh, oceanfront property. Uh, they, are, they also ha have a lot of water bodies that they have, uh, have to consider. Uh, the, the other thing is that uh, you're exactly right. It's where do we start? Um, and, um, and the examples you gave of people who live here in the town, I think are great examples of when we talk about engagement, that's the population. Those are the people that we would want to start engaging in. How do we maybe take this Falmouth uh, ordinance as a foundation and build build it out for Cape Elizabeth? Um, how do we take all of the work that's been done um, when uh, you look at South Portland and Portland's ordinances and the education, they're using the yardscaping that, it, that it, most every town is using as uh, the approach to educating uh, people on the use of uh, of pesticides and fertilizers. The other thing is that with anything that we do, we need to scope it and understand what problem we're trying to solve. I don't, uh, and that's a discussion that we had in the ordinance committee is that what's the problem we're trying to solve? Because we don't know how big the problem is. Um, uh, when you mention, uh, and Matt can probably talk about this better than I, uh, that many of our town properties, uh, Bob Malley, uh, several years ago, uh, took it, it upon himself after discussions uh, that we would look at the pesticides and uh, fertilizers that are being used on town properties. So that's that piece has been in place for several years. And I'm sure uh, we would want to, you know, roll that in and, and take a look at just as the schools uh, also address pesticide and uh, fertilizer use on their properties. But um, to to look at South Portland and Portland or to look at 
uh, another uh, community and say uh, that's the solution. Uh, that's why I am a proponent of Falmouth because the ordinance is written to help identify, to help address some of the uh, immediate needs such as around education, to know what pesticides are being applied in the community. That is why they registered the, pest the, uh, the lawn care companies so that you know what is being applied and where it's being applied. And then you can start identifying the water bodies that you want to protect or need to be protected because the more pesticide and uh, uh, other chemical applications are happening there. And then you can start taking those actions and start isolating where is it that we need to uh, uh, address the problems. So from my perspective, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Falmouth's ordinance is a strategy, and it's a very, it, I think it's written in a way that understands that um, we have to take care of invasive species. You can't have a blanket application that you're not going to apply any uh, pesticides. So if we take and we unravel that and we start to overlay it in Cape Elizabeth, I truly believe that is a first step. And then you start pulling the strings as you learn more and more data uh, and, uh, and then come up with the solutions that make sense for uh, our town because there's no such thing in my world as a one size fits all. And I think this helps us uh, solve the problem for Cape Elizabeth. Um, and they put, a, I think a pretty good uh, plan in place to make that happen, so. Um, Gretchen, go ahead, and then I know I know I think Matt can um, go a little deeper on what the town's currently doing too. But Gretchen, you go go ahead first. Thank you. Um, so I guess I just want to say I I feel really strongly about doing something about this, but I feel woefully undereducated on it. Um, I did want to go back and look at. It looks like the ordinance committee address this during three different meetings. I wanted to go back and I can't recall if those are recorded or if there's just minutes, but I wanted to go back and check those, but I got so into the catching up on the planning board meetings that I didn't get to it before this meeting. But I do feel like definitely, I, I personally would need a lot more information about what you did learn and, and what Falmouth looks like versus some of the others that we might wanna consider. Because to me at a glance, this, again, not knowing enough, it feels almost like it's not aggressive enough, but um, I understand and I absolutely agree that we need to, I think Penny, you said, get your arms around the issue and understand what it is, you know, what's happening in our town, what, what kind of pesticides, herbicides, whatnot are being used, what's the effect, what are the alternatives, we need to know all that, but, and being new to this, correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels a little odd to me to pass an ordinance to just mostly for the purposes of collecting data and it almost seems to me from this like that's what Falmouth did um and I'm a little concerned looking at this that they passed all of this and then most of it says but it's on hold so it says they wanted to collect data and they have everyone sending the data to the town but then it says assistance is still still needed to interpret it then it says they wanted to do testing, but that's on hold because of the cost. And they wanted to do education, but it's on hold. So I guess I'm feeling a little hesitant to just jump right in and base ours sort of off of what they've done when there seems like they're not even really implementing their own ordinance at this point. And I just wonder, we might wanna learn more about why and what's holding them back and try to avoid well, having the same pitfalls. Yeah dollars held them back for the water yeah. testing. So there'd need to be a dollar commitment. Uh, right. COVID held them back for the implementation of education. Yeah. Um, that's a no brainer. Um, and uh, the fact that they are having to, and I truly believe this, I think you need to understand who's doing applications in the community mm -hmm. and what they're applying. And you can't get that data at the state level because it's not carried by, uh, by town. It's, and so basically Falmouth set up a mechanism that will collect that data. 
Uh, and then you need to say, okay, how are you going to, who's going to interpret it? It's all of those things with any ordinance. If you, if you go and you say you're going to uh, ban pesticides uh, mm -hmm. for uh, residential use in Cape Elizabeth, you still need people to implement it. So, uh, so my position is, if you look at it, you can look and you can see um, uh, how one might take and implement specific aspects of that ordinance and what are the resources you would need to do it. Um, and um, and I, I will just go on record of say, and I'll say it again, I'm not a proponent of blanket um, uh, banning of uh, things that are currently people's choices, uh, as long as they're doing it responsibly. Um, and I do believe that anybody applying pesticides should be licensed, but we can't license everybody who's getting, uh, still putting Roundup on their lawn after reading every article about it. Um, but a key part of Boundless ordinance is education. Mm -hmm. It's a major part of it, and um, and that's why I I really think even if they haven't uh, had the opportunity to totally implement it, um, they have crafted something that we can look at and say mm -hmm. how can we apply this in Cape Elizabeth. Okay. Yep. That's go ahead, go ahead Valerie. Okay. I just wanted to um, respond to a couple things. Um, I hear what, what Penny's saying. My concern is um, we have information from uh, Friends of Casco Bay, from the Research Institute, Gulf of Maine. We know what chemicals are um, that we need to regulate so that larval shrimp isn't wiped out, right? We, we know that stuff. Um, we've got fishers who um, depend on on being able to fish out here. Um, we have pollinators. Um, our farmers need the pollinators. We we used to have um, fireflies. How many people see fireflies anymore? Um, there's there's so much going on that. Um, I'm just afraid that if we we wait on some of these things where we know what chemicals wipe out the larval shrimp, we know some of these things, some of it, I think we could start to regulate, um, get more information, have some hearings, uh, have community meetings. But I think that it's gonna be important for us to begin regulating it because um, it's impacting our, um, our, not only our industry, but our pollinators, our farmers, and um, not to mention our pets and our children, right? So um, I just think that some of this information we, we, we know, and um, we, we just need to start regulating. And it doesn't have to be, um, it, can, it can be thought out, and it could be something that we talk to people and educate, but um, I really think we need to begin the process. Penny, is your hand still raised or? Okay. Um, Matt, um, Jeremy, before I go to you, Matt, do, do you want to chime in briefly on, on some of the things that are actually happening on town property? Sure, yeah. The town currently has an organic program that we pursue on all the town properties as the first option and uh, have for, for a number of years. Uh, when you do find the exception that they do need to go to uh, uh, more of a conventional approach uh, than, than they do that, but it's ultimately at a last resort. The, the closest example that I could get to that would be uh, two years ago, we had a pretty significant tick outbreak over at Lions Field, and we had a number of small children who were, uh, who were getting some significant tick bites or basically uh, were coming out of the, uh, you know, the first cut of rough with a lot of ticks on them and some and concerns about deer ticks. So we did address that. Uh, but we do 
advertise it pretty heavily. We do have a certified uh, pesticide applicator on staff and Scott Smart, our parks foreman, who's fantastic. Uh, and conversations with Scott will also uh, indicate to you that even if you are applying organics, you need to be a certified uh, pesticide applicator. So it's the same qualifications that they need to know. So he, he's a wealth of information that may be uh, a resource a resource the town would want to look at, uh, at least from the policy side of it, to have that conversation at, as a certified applicator. So uh, he, he knows his business about as good as anybody uh, that you can find. So he's a, he's a great resource. But what we do ultimately, long story short, is our, our first approach is on the organic side of it. And then, uh, but if they do find something that it quite frankly just cannot be overcome, uh, the last resort is that we would go to something a little bit stronger in a very controlled atmosphere uh, or, or controlled application. And then the, the other part is Councilor Devereaux uh, also brought up, one of the last speakers you had before we went into quarantine was uh, was Mary Cirillo from uh, from uh, Friends of Casco Bay. So, uh, you know, and she had a good presentation regarding that. So I think that's, you know, the town's tried to, to also pursue uh, an education side of that as well as a component for, for the larger uh, side of it. And then the third thing to consider is enforcement is 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 a challenge, uh, just with staffing levels. Uh, you know, some of the towns that do enforce it on a heavier uh, layer, who do have more strident uh, restrictions, have larger staffs that they have dedicated for that management side of it. So that's just something to think about long term uh, downstream effects. Uh, pardon the pun, but uh, the downstream effects of of trying to manage and and and. Uh, and enforce uh, ordinances would be would be something that we, you'd also want to consider. That's not a cop out or an excuse. It's just something to consider. Uh, uh, so it's just part of part and parcel of the discussion. So uh, thanks thanks for the opportunity, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for that additional information, Matt. Jeremy, go ahead, and then Caitlin. Click the wrong button. Um, thanks, Jamie. Yeah, I and I think the other, you know, I guess to, to Valerie's um, point, um, the other sort of unintended consequence that I think about and and, and worry about some with going more in a aggressive uh, ban type approach is that um, a lot of the folks who are using these products now are, are going through lawn care and other um, landscaping companies that are that are using licensed applicators. And I know one of the challenges that that uh, the pesticide control board sort of deals with at the state level is these are commercially available products. And if you take the option off the table for licensed applicators to use them, it doesn't necessarily mean you're eliminating the use. It just means that, I mean, you might be eliminating some of the use, but you're, you're gonna push that use into hands of folks who are able to purchase the, the products for residential use. and may not know what they're using or what the soils that they're using them on can absorb um, effectively. And so you, you may wind up creating additional problems um, that, that aren't apparent on the landscape now. Um, so I, I guess that's one of the reasons that I'm, I'm particularly interested in this Falmouth-based approach where we can learn more about what the types of products that are being applied now are a significant portion of folks in town, and just looking around the, my neighborhood at the signs I see on the lawns, you know, are, are using lawn care companies who are licensed applicators, and and having some of that data, I think, will help us tailor better and more responsive ordinances that'll that'll deal with the problems. Caitlin, well, I was going to say a lot of what Matt said, chiming in about what the town does, because we went over this couple of years ago, but he covered that very well. Other than that, I was going to comment to Valerie's comments that I, I think we need to collect more data before we can go all gung so um, as Jeremy was saying, you know, it, this is the, the smartest approach so that we don't end up going somewhere we don't want to go. That was all. Thank you. Um, are there other comments from anybody? Um, one of the things, you know, is pointed out in the discussion of, um, in response to some of Gretchen's questions, um, no matter what we do, I think one of the things we need to make sure is that we're not creating an unfunded mandate. Um, so it sounded like part of the problem with implementation on the Falmouth side, um, was obviously circumstantial related to, um, 
last year in COVID, but also um, maybe not, um, you know, fully prioritized um, uh, allocation of funds to support uh, carrying out um, some of the things that are outlined in their ordinance. So um, I think we, I, I, I don't recall seeing anything that was in the current version of the budget that we've been looking at that specifically addresses this. And, you know, I'm sure that there are other ways through undesignated fund and things like that, that we could start to chip away at it. But um, I, I think I think some, some further and thorough discussion around, um, you know, if there are things that are going to be required and if they're um, set out with the purpose of obtaining a certain amount of information and all that kind of stuff, that um, we make sure that we've got both the, the funding mechanisms in place as well as, um, you know, a specifically architected um, tracking measurement plan to actually do what we're saying should be done. So, um, you know, or frankly, if if we were to go further than what's being proposed by the ordinance committee, there's a different set of um, expectations around, you know, both community outreach as well as um, outreach to vendors and um, uh, you know permitting um, uh, kinds of things and, and, and such like that. So, in any case, whatever avenue we wind up going down, I think. And I'm not, which is not to suggest the ordinance committee hasn't already considered this, but I think collectively we all need to have a little bit more thorough conversation around how do we actually put something into practice and what's required for that. And if there's funding associated with that, where's that coming from? So, um, Nicole, go ahead. I was going to ask what's our action item from tonight, but also what more do we expect to learn from now to a year from now, like what we know what's happening. We know why the towns around us are banning pesticides. And I agree outright ban might just push the product into the wrong hands and misuse. Um, so I definitely see both avenues of that, but I also don't have an answer to what more will we learn 12 months from now if we just implemented an education and testing and permitting approach. because. There's a lot already known. I mean, the sense that I have, um, and and feel free, ordinance committee members that have been um, a little deeper on this than than the rest of us, is that there's a lot of good and um, you know generalized information that's known about the area and and the region, but we don't have a lot of very specific information that's known about our town and our community. And so um, there are probably a lot of assumptions that can be drawn or um, are reasonable to make, um, but without doing the work to validate those things, um, I think we're still, uh, I, I don't wanna say it as crudely as, you know, throwing darts to the board or something like that, because it's, it's, it's obviously more than that. But um, I think, I think what I'm hearing is to figure out the, the very precise and specific solution to whatever the problem is here in Cape, more specific Cape information needs to be known versus broader information about a bunch of the towns sort of surrounding Casco Bay or, um, you know, other individual communities. Anybody I can else hear that, that, but there isn't a bubble around Cape Elizabeth that stops nope. a runoff from South Portland or Scarborough. Um, the other thing is the Falmouth ordinance looks very centered around commercial. And I would like to know, like, if we are getting this for data, I want homeowners to have to get a permit just like they have to do to burn a fire, right? Like, mm -hmm. so we can at least get data on what homeowners themselves are using. So I want it to at least go beyond the commercially licensed uh, people. So your previous question to start off though was around action item. And I, 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 I think we'll be definitely having more conversations about this before moving anything forward. So this is what I would expect to be the first of several conversations on this item, not something that's being pushed or rushed through um, in any way at all. So, you know, to, for yours and everybody else's um, sort of peace of mind on that, I, I, I don't expect that, um, you know, this is something that is one or two agendas out it you know might be might be a couple of couple of workshops that we have to have um to, to work through some of these points and, and so on so 
Um, Penny, sorry, did I cut you off? Um, I, I, I was thinking about action items, and um, but you kind of headed down the road of um, additional, um, additional workshop, and so therefore I'll take the tack that. Uh, so, what information are we going to bring forward to future workshops, or are we going to ask the ordinance committee to uh, take some additional action, or is there uh, an action that we want to uh, take that, I don't know, maybe the Conservation Commission fits in here somewhere? Um, I don't think it's so much... Penny, I don't think it's so much a matter of um, new or additional information to be introduced or work on the part of the ordinance committee to come back with, you know, other mm -hmm. alternatives or things like that. I think I think it's probably more just frank discussion, you know, frank discussion amongst us about which way some of us are, are you know, for, for many of us, you know, you know, getting this recommendation back after having been through some of the earlier discussions is the first time, you know, really re-engaging on this particular topic. And so, mm -hmm. um, as Gretchen said, you know, you know, she has interest in going back and, and looking through some of the details around um, the discussions that were had. I, I think that's a smart thing for all of us to do. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think there's necessarily sort of new exploration or, or new, new information or new work to be done so much as it's just giving us a little bit more time to sit with what we have. And then frankly, mm -hmm. just you know, have have a discussion where we say, well, you know, who's who's more interested in, you know, what I'm hearing from Valerie and Nicole of, of being a little bit more aggressive and, and, and pushing things a little harder and, and who's more in favor of a, uh, you know, a, a slower and more deliberate approach and, and, you know, just just go from there. So I'm certainly not ready to bring this forward to say Monday's agenda. Um, and uh, I think I just think that there's a little bit more discussion for us to have on it. I'm, I'm not talking about parking it for six months and coming back to it then. I'm, I'm talking about continuing to work this at our, our next couple of workshops or so. So is there something, because um, that says to me that some of the, um, the, I mean, the presentation that we had on uh, yardscapes, I think was really beneficial to understand mm -hmm. because many communities have implemented based on that. Um, and I think there was the, uh, along with that presentation, we had a, uh, 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 the, the person who did that, she was a wealth of information. So maybe there's a presentation that needs to happen around that so that um, uh, people are aware of what that's all about. Um, but uh, anyway, that's just my thought. Jeremy, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to respond briefly to Nicole's question about what more we would learn to. I, I, there is a lot known about these chemicals and how they interact with the environment. I think what, we're, what we would be hoping to gain from this sort of an approach to an ordinance is more information about what's being used and where. And I know sort of from regional level discussions with folks at Casco Bay Estuary Partnership and Friends of Casco Bay, there's a lot of regional level questions about you know, sort of what chemicals are being applied, how they're currently being, being broken down in the environment and what impacts are being seen across Casco Bay. Um, and certainly when you, when you drill down to that local level, we just don't have that information. Um, so, you know, looking at different types of chemicals and, you know, what the level of application is across the landscape and how much of that's being broken down in soils or making its way into Casco Bay. I think those are the kinds of questions that this ordinance, this type of an ordinance would let us have better answers to than we currently do. Um, and hopefully also, uh, I know nitrogen loading is, is becoming a more significant topic around Casco Bay. Um, and I, I appreciate Penny's um, desire to keep fertilizer in as part of the mix, uh, but th that's something that there's a, you know, still a, a fair amount of, of questions around in terms of what, you know, how those regional sources are playing out and, and in terms of where, you know, where the nitrogen sources are coming in and how those are interacting with systems in the Bay. So I, I do think there's, significant more information that we could use to help us craft a better policy response. I guess that's that's my, my perspective.
Um, all right, given um, the time uh, and, and the fact that we've just discussed, uh, you know, having further additional conversations on this, unless anybody has anything that um, is just absolutely critical to add to the discussion at this point, um, I'd say let's bring this back around for, um, you know, our next um, group workshop. And, um, you know, I mean, if, if people do have other pieces of information or data that they want to introduce to the discussion, by all means, please do that. But I, I'm not, I'm personally not looking for to task anybody with more things, um, you know, to do on this particular topic. Like I said, I think we just need to have a little bit more discussion amongst ourselves on it. So, um, and again, thank you, um, you know, to the ordinance committee for the work that you've put, put in on this. Much appreciated. Um, so with that, um, try and get us across the finish line here with uh, our last item, which Maureen has been patiently um, waiting through all this uh, with us. Um, and do we have anybody from the Conservation Committee with us too, or Maureen, is it just you? It's just me. Well, it's not just you. It's, but oh, it's you just it. me. <laughs> um, so uh, this is something that we um, uh, kicked over to the Conservation Committee to work on, if you remember, um, several months ago, or yeah, a couple months ago now, um, with um, the unnamed bodies of water in town that were desperately seeking names. Um, so Maureen, would you like to uh, give us a brief introduction on what, what's what been brought forward here. Certainly. Uh, so I promised Matt I would not take more than three minutes. So I'm gonna put my timer on and make sure that I don't do that. And uh, so this is a recommendation from the comprehensive plan adopted by the town council in 2019, number 72, assign names to significant unnamed bodies of water and streams. The reality is, if you look at a map of Cape Elizabeth, there's a lot of uh, bodies of water, especially small ponds and a lot of streams that don't have names that show up on the USGS maps. And so they're not really official names. And if you don't name them, they seem to start getting official names without the town of Cape Elizabeth be really being involved. So the Conservation Committee went through a significant process. We had our GIS consultant look at these GIS maps, other data, and any pond that was greater than uh, three quarters of an acre or any stream that was longer than 500 feet was assigned a unique number. Uh, and then we set up a survey on the town's website last summer. We mailed an invitation to everyone who abutted any one of these and invited them to work their way through this, this poll and uh, suggest names. And so we got about 70 people who participated. Some of the names weren't really worth considering, but uh, we took all the names that were suggested and the conservation committee work their way through it. And they've given you a recommendation uh, for most of these places. Uh, we did get some uh, input from the members of the Cape Elizabeth Historical Society from the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. And we are trying to follow the Bureau of Names protocols so that if you approve a set of names, we can submit them to the feds and maybe they will end up on the USGS maps and they will really become official at that point. So I, I'm going to stop at that point and, and see if you have any questions. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the Conservation Committee and others involved, um, as you noted. Um, are there any counselors that want to kick off the discussion on this? Was there, was there anyone else actually, I assume that, but was there anyone else that wanted to speak on this from the public? I apologize for skipping that. Don't see anybody. Um, so go ahead, Nicole. Yeah, I know that this has been a very long process and I don't intend to make it longer. However, um, has this been run through our, I don't even know if it's in existence yet, this, this diversity, equity, and inclusion, subcommittee to make sure that there's representation on here. 
um, I think that that would be a good exercise for that new subcommittee. Uh, this was not, there was no connection. There was no formal reaching out to anybody except the historic committee and um, CELT. We got um, some input from the Sprague Corporation. Go ahead, Jeremy. I had a similar question um, and, and I generally, thank you for the good, great work that went into this, Maureen. The only two items that jumped out at me is ones that I had uh, particular issues with. I'm not a huge fan of taking names like, like back and run for water bodies that are sort of regionally specific to other parts of the world and applying them here, but I can live with it. Um, the ones that, that um, I had particular questions about, one, one is S29. Um, and I, I do think I would like to have some input from the um, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee on whether or not there's they see a problem with applying Rebels Run as a place name. Um, I, as someone who grew up in the Mid-Atlantic, kind of do. Um, and, um, and then the other one that I, I, and this is just a personal preference, but I'll go ahead and express it, S26. Um, is not big enough to be a river. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, um, it does not drain more than 40 square miles. Um, I would rather call it a stream or a brook. Jeremy, what was the first one you mentioned? I, I just didn't catch the... Um, S29 is, is proposed as being Rebels Run. No, no, uh, was it Windbore Beck? Is that what you were saying? Oh yeah, so there's there's three features, um, S11, S23, and S27 that all have the name Beck as, instead of Stream, um, and then there's four features that have or five features, four features um, that have the the word Run, um, which you know is a, oh, a standard right. yeah standard okay. name for a stream in the Mid Atlantic, but I've never really seen it seen it applied for a, 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 sort of a colloquial name for a stream in, in the Northeast. I was, I'd never, I've never even heard the word Beck before, run I have, but not, not Beck. So I, I didn't even know what that was. I didn't know if that was a person or something, so. I, I believe they use it in Scotland mostly. Okay. Um, other, other comments, discussion? Um, Maureen, there. Wait, just a second, Matt. There's, there's. Um, we're not trying to trying to move or finalize this, you know, on on any kind of specific timeline or or predetermined deadline of any kind, right? I mean, this is stuff that's been sitting for a while. It's part of our comp plan to get this done, but there's there's no external driver of completion on this, right? Absolutely not. Okay. Um, Gretchen, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I'll just say I had the same thought as Jeremy did about S29. So I, I also would advocate maybe for um, at least taking a look at that one. Um, and in terms of, I think what Maureen might be looking for too um, with guidance for whether we wanna to try to make these official or whatnot, I think it's a great point that they probably come up, they probably wind up with sort of names that are known locally and I think Speaking as a first responder, I'll just say, I think it's nice to have an official name for these places. It'd be great if someone, if we got a call and it said that someone went through Crescent Pond instead of, you know, someone calls it Bobby's Pond and someone calls it the pond off thus and so road. Um, I think it's really nice to have them all um, official. And I think making them, you know, on the, um, on the federal maps probably would be helpful too. So that's what I would agree to taking that step. Um, I'm just going to say yesterday was May 4th, and I don't know why y'all are hating on Rebels Run. So <laughs> the Rebel Alliance runs strong in Cape Elizabeth. So. It's the rise um, of the fifth today, Jamie. I know. <laughs> revenge, of the, revenge of the fifth. Um, Matt, what were you going to, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, uh, uh, would the council like to refer this uh, informally over to the uh, civil rights uh, sorry, the uh, Cape Diversity and Inclusion Committee to uh, to have a, a review as well. 
and because we can get this to Rachel and have it on the next agenda for them to provide input on as well. And uh, uh, be, be, we'd be happy to do that, then come back uh, as well. It, cause, yeah, cause as Maureen said, there is no there is no deadline or timeline on this. It's just uh, it's at the comp plan and uh, as a goal to get completed as well. So. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. I'm seeing heads nod, so um, I, I would I would say that that would be the good next step. So, go ahead, Valerie. Um, I, I was just going to make that same suggestion, and I looking at it also. I just want to point out that um, S31 is called Blissful Alley, um, and when Gretchen was saying, you know, when you uh, when you're when you're calling dispatch alley, um, are they going to know that that's a stream or whatever this is, um, that, that even the run, um, sometimes streets, street names end with run. So it seems like a little, it might be a little confusing to call it a run or, or an alley. Um, so just some of my thoughts there, but I think it's- A run is a fish run, right? I mean, is that what that's referenced to? I, that's what I, I thought that was. Respectfully. I think you're reading a lot more thought and meaning into some of these names <laughs> than might have actually occurred. And I would suggest one that the conservation committee is done, done, done with this item. Uh, and two, perhaps we could send this to the diversity committee with a little list of the things that you would like them to definitely change. And I'd be happy to compile that list. I'm not sure if it's a matter of um, asking them to change them so much it's, it's asking them to apply um, their point of view and perspective to make sure that things aren't missed for sensitivity reasons and things like that. Um, but they may not I don't think care they're... about Beck and you may still care about it. Well then I think that's a decision then for us to make but okay. um, I, I don't I, I, I hear your point about the conservation committee I don't think anybody's looking to kick it back to them. Um, I as far as run goes, I always thought that that was uh, uh, a fishing reference, like the salmon run and stuff like that. And um, so maybe, uh, maybe I either had that incorrect or just that's not as common nomenclature as I thought it was. Um, I had never heard the word back, um, except for the um, the band <laughs> uh, today. So. <laughs> Um, anyway, that's enough of my pop culture references. Um, we'll send it over to the um, uh, diversity committee just for their, like I said, perspective um, and, and sort of to apply their filter to it um, and then see what comes back. And um, we'll leave it to the council to make a ultimate and final determination on these. But um, unless anybody has anything else to add, I think we can wrap that item, so. And thank you, Maureen, for, um, I feel like we always stick you with items that require you to be patient for the first two hours of a meeting at least, and then um, hang in there for the last, but um, thank you for doing that regardless. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I, I am a night owl, so. <laughs> um, is there anything else that anybody uh, has before we look to adjourn? And, um, are any of the remaining three folks in the audience or two folks besides Maureen uh, interested to offer any comment? See, nope. Oh. Go ahead, Ms. Wasserman. Uh, Matt, I'll open your mic in just a second. Hold on. Just strongly encourage you everybody. I strongly encourage everybody on the committee, just it's eye opening to put yourself on the list up in Augusta to be notified when things are being applied to contiguous properties. It is eye popping and my phone does not stop ringing. Uh, you have to do it in November, December. You can't just start now, but that's just for commercial. It's not for what people are applying themselves on their lines. It is truly eye opening to see how much is going on right now. You know, chemical by chemical stuff that shouldn't be applied that with my own eyes I'm seeing applied to wetland properties. It's just mind-boggling. So thanks. I encourage you to try it. It's really an amazing experience, unfortunately. But thank you again for all you're doing. I, I really <laughs> cannot uh, ex extend my appreciation any, you know, enough for all the time and energy and effort and goodwill that you apply to all of these items that are all important. <laughs>
So thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and thanks for participating in the meeting. Um, so seeing nothing else, um, we will uh, we will adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.